Dear Lord, we are amazed at your thoughtful care. that you brought a people from 1989 to 2022. And prepared them. That you gave all that was necessary. That in all the trauma of the last two years, We don't have to live in fear of what we don't know. Because of what you have revealed of yourself. And these final events. I pray that we will all feel more deeply. A feeling, but also an intellectual acknowledgement that you have guided us so faithfully in our past history. That we have nothing to fear. I pray that you will be with your people now. As we navigate a new dispensation. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Going to have the chat left on today. Because there is, uh, I do want to ask some questions as we go through. I'll tell you when that is. We know where we are on the reform line. Line singular. One line singular. You're not on reform lines anymore. We stand here and we look back and see how God led. There is a lot to say about 2021. From January 6 to December 27, from the King of the North democracy and women's rights. From the King of the South, dictatorship and spheres of influence. From unprecedented conflict between East and West, All of that separate to Afghanistan. And the issue of gender within Adventism. Much has already been said. Even more has already been said on the media broadcast. And we will discuss it, but not today. I know that this isn't technically correct, but I feel like this is my last opportunity to speak to you.
it might going forward feel like nothing has changed. But it has. I want one last opportunity to speak to the priests. And if you're a priest, 2021 isn't that big of a deal. It's just reaping the reward of a battle already fought. It has more to say for the 144,000. When we consider the journey from 2001 to the Sunday Law, and understand 2019 as the increase of knowledge, What was presented in 2019 was feminism. But that had already, already been accepted or rejected the year before. In 2018, What was presented in 2021 was a refining of the message of feminism. Dividing cultural, liberal and radical. but it had already been accepted or rejected the year before. I just want us to picture these reform lines and how the message has developed. It's all one smashed together history. But when you divide it up and look at how the message developed, It's quite beautiful in its symmetry. We have to divide the lines. And see how we experienced the increase of knowledge and the formalization. at the same time as experiencing the reform line of the priests. What I want us to focus on at the first part of this presentation is 2014. and 2018. What do we know about 2018? We know it isn't on this line. 
And yet Ellen White tells us, quote number two, In 1845, she has a vision. Before the throne, she sees the Advent people, the church and the world. She sees a company bowed before the throne. Some were deeply interested, but most were disinterested and careless. Quoting, then I saw an exceeding bright light come from the Father to the Son, and from the Son it waved over the people before the throne. But few would receive this great light. Many came out from under it and immediately resisted it. Others were careless and did not cherish the light and it moved off from them. Some cherished it and went and bowed down with the little praying company. We often picture that there's two groups in this history. But there's not two, there's three. There are those who immediately reject. Refuse to receive it. and they fight it. Reference is broadside one. April 6, 1846, paragraph 7. One group fights. It's okay, I, I suddenly read French. One group fights. One group accepts. But there's a third group who accept. But don't cherish it. That is the most heartbreaking. There was a fight in 2019 when the light of the midnight cry was quickly rejected. By those who immediately resisted it. Others accepted with their, all their heart and cherished it. But hundreds in this movement accepted it in 2019. But did not cherish. They were careless with the messages God gave. That has been the struggle of the last two years. And what we continue to struggle with. Paragraph two of this same section. Makes the, the key point I would just want us to take from this.
I won't read it for time. But this is where she says, this light of the midnight cry, how far along does it light the path? It lights the path all the way to the second advent. So while it might not be a way mark on this reform line, even the 144,000 walk in this light for the rest of their journey. But I'm not saying that to make a point about 2018. As we look directly in front of us and see the Sunday law, I want us to consider 2014. If we walk in the light of the midnight cry all the way to the second advent, I want to broaden that and suggest that when we consider the Sunday law, we walk in the events of, this, of 2014 all the way through. And it's in understanding 2014 that we will understand the Sunday law. A little model that has lived in my mind It might be too simple an illustration. But I'd like to cons us to consider our reform line in two parts. Nineteen eighty nine to two thousand and fourteen. Is all about showing us 2014 understand and accept the date the existence of 2014 All this history is preparing us for 2014. Not its content, just the fact it exists. And the implications to the fact that it exists. Those implications are we are the final generation, God is regathering uh, the 140, gathering the 144,000. The United States is collapsing. And Adventism is failing.
In all of that, you can see time setting, the 2520. Daniel 11, 40 to 45, reform lines. And in 2014, God expects you to accept 2014 as B slash A Sunday law. So I just talked up the significance and importance of the midnight cry. But all that this history is, is making us understand and accept 2014. Not the fact that it exists, but now the content. So for all those living between 2014 and 2018, God gave you a box. He said, don't open it. You're not ready to open it yet. But it's labeled Sunday law on the side. Just take it and accept it. But then what we had to do was open it. and start pulling out 2014. And people looked in the box and tried to find Obamacare. And evidence of how Clinton was destroying America. And when they opened up the box, can't draw a box, square will do. When I opened up the box, they couldn't recognize the content. Our reform line revolves around 2014. First, accepting its existence. having the faith to hold on to that while not fully understanding it. And then opening it up and considering the content. We had to consider the implications of its existence. Over the last couple of years, we have had to consider the implications of its content. This is the portion I designed to be interactive with the chat. I want to take a moment not to go into detail But I want us to consider and as you feel comfortable to write in the events of 2014. Now don't start Googling and throwing everything.
You've all been following the media broadcast. Please answer from memory. I'm looking for three key events first. that directly relate to the US government. Purging of Republican Party of moderates. This sets up a complete transformation of the Republican Party. that's going to, if you followed this year, it's not just 2016. They had opportunity after opportunity to turn this around. So if we can stop commenting for the moment, because I will lose you. I'll lose your comments while I'm talking now. The transformation of the Republican Party. I'm not sure if we fully grasp the significance of what has taken place. And I would suggest a key turning point was in Trump's first impeachment. Where they had to make a decision. Would they follow Trump? embrace his conspiracy theories completely throw in their independence of a party to his cult of personality Or would they stay the conservative party that they are, but distance themselves? I would suggest they took that final road when they chose Trump's side in the first impeachment over Ukraine. Accepting his conspiracy theories then, put them in the place where they had to accept his conspiracy theories about the 2020 election results. And they chose Trump on November 9, 2019. When they said that in that impeachment, they wanted to pursue the whistleblower and Hunter Biden. A transformation of the Republican Party. To something essentially 
fascist. January 6 in this year has shown us a little bit more of what that looks like. The second key issue that related to the to these branches is McConnell blocking judicial appointments. Have we seen the results of that this year? With the Supreme Court. One more that relates to the Supreme Court. What was the key Supreme Court case? RBG wrote a 35-page dissent. Hobby Lobby. Subject? Birth control and religious freedom. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg saw the implications of that wrong decision. Okay, we've got those three out of the way. Go for it. What have you got? The rise of Modi, yes. The world's largest democracy is not the United States. If you're going to see democracy crumble at the end of the world, You need to see India. It is the beginning of the authoritarian fall of the world's largest democracy. And we see there all the elements of what is occurring in the United States. particularly how Modi has weaponized a church and state relationship. Using Hindu nationalism. What else? I have how many? I have about 26 all up. Invasion of Ukraine. Do we see that this year? What else? Twenty fourteen midterm elections.
I agree, but I'm tying that into these two. I guess these two are what they do because they have that control. Repam? That is the papacy. Counterfeit equality. Capitol Hill riots. I wasn't aware of that in 2014. I might need to look into that. Turning point of climate change, yes. Not necessarily in the climate itself. But in the release of quite a number of studies. It was a turning point in the understanding, in the knowledge of climate change. So, yes. Gamergate. Being in a bubble as we can be. Being in a bubble, sometimes we don't realize uh, the significance of some events. The size and the impact of the gaming industry. Now, liberals say video games don't kill people. Guns kill people. For me, that is the same argument. When conservatives say guns don't kill people, people kill people. They're both foolish arguments. The gaming industry does not just foment violence. The perception and, of, and treatment of women by both the companies and the gaming communities has had a massive impact on the rise of the far right. And the treatment and perceptions of women today. One example from December 28. The company behind the game League of Legends has been ordered to pay $100 million
in a court case brought to them by more than 2,000 current and former female employees. because of the sex discrimination and harassment that they experienced. Gender discrimination. Unequal pay. Harassment. and retaliation for those who complain. Cambridge Analytica. Harvest the data of tens of millions of Facebook accounts. that will be later weaponized in the 2016 election. Flint water crisis. That's going to have a deep impact on uh, some of the perceptions of Barack Obama. Black Lives Matter, I'm not arguing you can't put it in 2014. My understanding it was created in 2013. But like the subject of gay marriage, I suspect that um, you can tie it into that history. For time, I'm just going to start listing. There was an obvious mobilization in the incel movement. Now I'm trusting people are not Googling. Russian hacking of the State Department. They tested the US capabilities in 2014 in preparation. The Russian Internet Research Agency. Created in 2013, but becoming active in 2014. And in 2014, they're already targeting the United States and Ukraine. Russia's connection to China. It's the signing of the strategic partnership between Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. This is when the two powerful leaders officially unite. This is their strategic partnership.
and they begin construction on the power of Siberia pipeline. There's a terrorist attack in Yunnan. by Igo separatists. And this is going to spark in 2014 comments by China. that is um, going to develop from 2014 to now into a genocide. Whatever China says, when the birth rate of a population goes down by 50% in a couple of years, Everything is not okay. Is this affecting 2021? What is Biden sanctioning China for? Trump was happy to fight with China. over power, trade. I'm not suggesting though that they don't fight China. But the motive which Biden got correct should be human rights. Focusing still on China. Hong Kong. This was the umbrella revolution. Of 2014. It erupts again in 2019. From 2019 to 2021, China crushes that revolution and takes over Hong Kong. Turkey, 2014, the rise of Erdogan. Afghanistan, the beginning of the final phase. ISIS, beginning of the caliphate. Syria. Beginning of US in involvement, US strikes. Now Obama is attacking ISIS. Not Assad. but I would connect it to the Syrian civil war. Because Assad deliberately allowed the rise of ISIS in Syria. So the West would be distracted and start this fight.
this was part of the battle strategy of the Syrian civil war. Gay marriage, the turning point. Between 13 and 15. The Hero Act. Houston Equal Rights Ordinance. This is marking the, the real beginning of a culture war over the subject of trans people. I just want to read a little. Now that we're on the subject of gender. Uh, yes, Steve Bannon. Explained his full world view uh, in the Vatican. There was an important document released. I think that went on the broadcast about that. The Southern Baptist Convention. An unpleasant prophetic church we keep revisiting. Unpleasant because its history connects the subject of slavery of Millerite history to the subject of gender in our own. In 2014, they approve a resolution. that God's good design is that gender identity is determined by biological sex alone. So we can mark the Southern Baptist when it comes to trans. I want to quote Adventism. Spectrum Magazine. From late 2014 to late 2015, Trans people became not only a topic of serious discussion within Adventism, but also the subject of multiple position statements. A film project. Several articles. even a talking point for the first Seventh-day Adventist candidate for President of the United States. Ben Carson. For the first time, transgender people showed up on Adventist radar in a significant way.
In October of 2014, the Biblical Research Institute's Ethics Committee authored a statement on transgenderism. I apologise to the translators, these quotes were not in your document. That's my mistake. Just take the point that transgenderism became, as they say, it became a, for the first time, a major issue within Adventism. Broken chair. Sorry. I will put this quote for the translators. You don't need to translate that, but I will put the quote in. Um, I'll put this quote into the chat. And it appears it will not let me. I'm sorry, that's not going to work. Okay. Guidelines adopted by church leadership in 2014. State. It is inconsistent with the Adventist church's understanding of scriptural teaching. to admit into or maintain in membership persons practicing sexual behaviours incompatible with biblical teaching. Neither is it acceptable for Adventist pastors or churches to provide wedding services or facilities for same-sex couples. So LGBT for Adventism in 2014 did not, did not go well. Now we mark 2015 when it comes to gay marriage. But it's 2014 that was the turning point. And it was in October 2014 that the General Conference agreed to consider women's ordination. Much of the discussion and the fighting has already happened by the time you get to 2015. It took place in 2014. So back in this history, where accepting 2014 exists, but what do we do with the content? How much of this can we unpack in 2014? Can we unpack the purging of the Republican Party? The 
the turning of the judicial branch. The Hobby Lobby decision. Modi. Russia and Ukraine. The REPAM conference project. Climate change. Sexism in the gaming industry. Cambridge Analytica. Flint. Okay, maybe. The incel movement. Russian hacking of the State Department. King of the South is dead, isn't he? Russian disinformation and conspiracy theories. The coming together of Russia and China. A developing genocide. The fall of Hong Kong. Turkey. Maybe Afghanistan. We could have at least commented on some of the external events. ISIS, yes. We could talk about Syria. Gay marriage. The culture war over trans and gender. The Southern Baptist and Adventist fight over LGBT. And women's ordination. We could have, like Obamacare, commented on some of them. But gotten them wrong. But gotten it wrong. But that's not my point. It's not to beat up on the movement. Because if God saw better people to choose, he would have chosen them. If God thought he could have talked through liberal Adventism, he would have. If he thought he could talk about through nice people in the world, he would have. This was the best God could do because regardless of what you think of the members sitting next to you, God gave his messages to the very best. The best option he had. It doesn't matter if you're an Adventist in 2014. Saying gay marriage sounds good to you. If God could have raised a movement out of those people, he would have. But he couldn't because they're in their own mess.
And that's something that people in this movement are losing sight of. So my point is not a negative one. My point is positive. That this is just how it was, just how it had to be. Because it doesn't matter how you feel about gay marriage here. If you've been back here and rejected the 2520, you won't get the light. Accepting the date Accept the content. Accept the implications of there being a date. Predicted in 2012 as a Sunday law. Accept the content. and the implications of the content. Accept how God tells us to view and feel about these events. not just external events of Russia, but the, the, the wheels turning within the United States and Adventism on all the issues that relate to democracy and gender. And my question is how do you view this Sunday law? Because the content of this Sunday law should not take us by surprise. What God tends to do is look at a complex history And over a mess of events, put a very simple structure. If you want an example of that, go to the first four trumpets. The whole fall of Rome in the West. a mess of events. Ellen White says there's too many tribes. God picks four, lays out four neat trumpets. Four neat little steps that collapse Western Rome. Now, when you're living in that history, that's not what it looks like. It's much more messy. But without a structure, It's too easy to lose sight of what is going on. So 
So God in his kindness gives us these simple structures. Like lines of revolutions. Like World War I plus World War II equals World War III. These structures help us see what is really happening in a mess of events. And I'm still hearing people talk as if this coming Sunday law is one decision of the Supreme Court. That'll just be simple, standalone date. Twenty fourteen is one of the only significant dates on our reform line. that does not have a singular date. If we're going to not be shaken by what this Sunday law looks like, we should, we should familiarize ourselves with 2014. The Sunday law is going to be a process of history just the same. Perhaps more extended than we realise. So from 2014 to 2021, many waymarks, many events. Many messages. But I think what God is trying to do is really quite simple. The movement God raised up walked through their Sunday law history. And God wanted to explain it to them. Everything since has just been that. So blessed are they who walked from 2012 to 2019 waiting to understand it but not shaken. Ellen White said, that if Miller had have understood and accepted the third angel's message, all his doubts and questions over the second would have been answered for him. God never removes all cause for doubt. But he has given us so much evidence.
I only have a few minutes left. And I am on page five of 13. So I'm not getting through. I had one other point I wanted to make. I think I will touch on it. Now that we've accepted it centers on 2014, God tried to explain to us 2014 in two parts. Two dispensations. We get to here. We understand equality, feminism. But it's to such a superficial level. Then we come here. It's May 2020. Apis Bull. Now I want to speak for a moment on gender. There can be a, con a confusion in the movement. about the test we face. And it comes up over and over again. The issue is we know the Sunday law is gender. But people keep trying to bring in other issues of equality. Over the last two years, I could say over the last two months, I hear more and more thoughts along the lines of people saying race is part of the Sunday law test. Immigration. Mental illness. Treatment of children. Disability. Classism. Ageism. Islamophobia. To say it simply, I think that's a negative response of the movement. Our alpha history was a subject of race. Slavery. The counterfeit alpha history was a subject of race. The Holocaust. 
Do you see gender as a subject in Millerite history? A women's rights a subject of Millerite history? Yes. Why did God choose a female prophet? Did he try with two men and then run out of men to choose? No. God recognised there was a gender component. He chose Ellen White. Because he knows we're not to heaven yet and this is coming. He knows that we have another curse to deal with. So he's looking, he's looking forward, he sees this coming. And gender becomes a component. Is gender a component in the alpha of the counterfeit? Satan counterfeits. Lucia. But what we don't do is use that to distract from the sin of the Holocaust. I would suggest to do that, to start putting the two side by side, would suggest that people don't get how bad the Holocaust was. We need to look at the test of the history. This Sunday law has two components, two parts to it. At the same time as gender is the test, it's happening in the context of a failing democracy. It's connected, but it's also separate. As we can see in 2014. The minute you have democracy falling, if democracy is falling, what is rising? Nationalism. If nationalism is rising, what is rising? Fascism. If fascism is rising, what is rising? Racism. You cannot have a falling, failing democracy without seeing nationalism, racism. That's true for the United States, for Russia, Poland, India, China, and it is not a Christian problem. There is no such thing as a secular society. I know people for many years who are Adventists. Very morally liberal Adventists. 
very morally conservative Adventists. And they both think the exact same about these external issues. I don't care if they're in skirts or clubbing on Sabbath, they view these external issues the same way. But stranger than that is so do all my friends who are ex-Adventists. China might like to think it is a modern secular society. What they're impacted by is culture. That culture can have a history tied to a type of Christianity. Hinduism or Islam. It all comes back to paganism. That's what this formalization was meant to tell you. Islam comes out of a pit. What also comes out of the pit? Babylon. It's all a counterfeit. And if something is a counterfeit, it cannot get equality. Any form of equality. That is why whether or not you look at China, Hindu India, Islamic Afghanistan, secular countries, Catholic countries, unless they deal with the sin problem, That mindset remains. As long as you have falling democracy, race has to be a component of the test. Let me rephrase that before you translate. Race has to be a component of the Sunday law. But the test is still clear. We don't mix them in 1850. Or in 1939. We still differentiate. So we should be very careful with the respect that we treat this test. Sacramento, camp meeting. To the question. So that is one half of what I hoped to cover, but we'll close for time. I want to, I want to summarize.
differentiating between the test of the Sunday law and the way mark. I'm recognizing that when you deal with equality and democracy, there are many visible external components. Like 2014, it's complicated. But God gave us again a simple structure to show us what we needed to see in a complicated history. Gender, worship, race. From 1798, Race, worship, gender. And you could argue that you see the Sabbath in this history. Because when we call people out of Babylon, we'll be saying, by the way, you need to keep the Sabbath. By the way, we'll also be saying you better not be nationalistic or racist. But at the outset of the understanding of equality, we were given a simple structure. So we would know what the test was. The problem is I think it's much more comfortable for people to broaden that field of equality rather than have a good hard look at liberal cultural and radical feminism. Liberal, cultural and radical. It would be easier to talk about Islamophobia, about Frankly, racism. Because none of those other topics make us look as bad. Or the people we love. So God keeps pulling us back. Summarizing. Complicated history. As a priest, which you no longer are, but your training centered on this date. And as we stand here and look at this event, we should consider how how short and how simple do we expect it to be? The issue has never been that there is going to be a Sunday law. or a one world government.
or homage given to the papacy. What has divided us from Adventism is what we think that will look like. And that's what this event and everything given to us to explain this event is the training that we have to take to Adventism. I wanted to talk about Laodicea and the Laodiceanism that exists in this movement. We don't have time for that. But I will quote. The message to the Laodicean church is applicable to all. who have had great light and many opportunities and yet have not appreciated them. Have we had great light and many opportunities? She says, people are willing to make so much sacrifice for a temporary, temporal pleasure. And yet they're living as if they have forever. In 2019, At the German International Camp Meeting, people were divided by language into Sabbath schools. And one of these Sabbath schools in the English language was led by the United States. And it was a Sabbath school devoid of a straight prophetic message. It was a Sabbath school empty of a straight prophetic message. Everyone said amen. Most people said amen. as person after person spoke of grace and love and tolerance. And in the next few days, multitudes of them left the movement. I see a rising swell of the same language today Peace and safety. Tread gently with those who are not as far as you along in their spiritual walk. And people don't get how dangerous that is. But 
the Leidocene condition requires a straight message. Guilt, wrong and sin are parts of the Leidocene message. These the Adventist preacher must not neglect. Ministers who are preaching present truth should not neglect the solemn message to the later scenes. The testimony of the true witness is not a smooth message. And yet in some of the same places that made this mistake in 2019, it is happening again. Do not choose subjects that please people and offend none. And yet part of the failure to teach equality in a correct light causes meetings to become echo chambers talking of grace and love and tolerance. That please people and offend none. And because of that, they think they're teaching equality. And members say amen and recommend these sermons. Frankly, I am terrified of that type of message going to a later seen Adventist church. If anything said that we had failed as a movement, that would be it. Ellen White says, this is shunning the cross of Christ. Like Christ, we're not here to bring peace, we're here to bring a sword. And if you're going to say in a presentation, or based on grace and love, that you'll hear in any church. Because frankly, it's meaningless. And then say that we need to be careful that we don't pretend or act like we're better. than anyone not in the movement. Why are you here? If God did all this for you, nothing shows a lack of appreciation more of the prophetic context of this movement
than saying, don't pretend you're better. If you say that you're speaking morally, not prophetically, you do not have the freedom to do that. You're a member of a movement. You're an ambassador. If you don't think you're better, then Ted Wilson You've taken off your prophetic glasses. That's what the United States did in 2019. Frankly, that's what most of Lambert Fellowship did in 2019. So treasure those, treasure the people causing offence. Because what that is hitting is your later seeing condition. Before anyone says amen, make sure I'm not talking to you. Support the female leaders of this movement. Who are giving this message a certain sound. Nothing says later scenism more than to look how God has led us and not appreciate it. So consider this. Consider the Sunday law that is right in front of you. Consider that God brought you into the position to be on the front lines of an unpopular message. An offensive message. but a necessary one. If you kneel with me, we'll close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for how you have led. May we not carry our simplistic and wrong ideas of what the future looks like into the Sunday law history. May we, may we look at 2014 May we project that that we can be prepared. May we treasure the midnight cry. Lord, may we treasure the messages you have opened up. And may we not resent the people who make us uncomfortable. When they give the message to Laodicea, 
and we find it pricks our own conscience. May we not give peace and safety. to a world that is literally and figuratively burning. Lord, may we consider carefully and seriously the responsibility that you have chosen to place on the shoulders of every one of us. and consider our own personal response to your calling. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.